All right, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Town Hall Tuesdays. My name is Deanna Fenton, Program Manager here at the Alliance, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to our fifth installment of the virtual Town Hall series, which will focus on collaborative prep work as it relates to family conversations in DCB cases. Now, before we begin, I'd like to briefly really review some important information regarding today's program, as well as some of our future Town Halls. Now, first and foremost, as always, you may have noticed that your audio lines have been muted. Your lines will remain muted for the duration of the town hall presentation. That said, all questions or comments will need to be submitted electronically using our Zoom chat feature or Q&A feature. So for those of you who submitted questions um, during the registration process, please just note that we've done our best to compile your questions and we will have our speakers address them throughout the course of today's presentation. However, should you have any additional questions or comments, please feel free once again to submit them using that um, chat feature or the Q&A. As always, following the conclusion of today's town hall, you will all receive an email from us with outline instructions on how to access our post town hall evaluation. Now, while continuing education credits are not being offered for this program, you'll all have the opportunity to claim a certificate of completion as a result of your participation in today's town hall. We highly recommend that you complete these evaluations as your feedback is invaluable to us and will help us to develop future programs. If you have any issues at any point in time, please don't hesitate to contact a member from the Alliance team. Now, as an added note, we will be recording today's presentation. So if you or a colleague is interested in viewing today's town hall at a later date, you can always access the recording on our website at organdonationalliance.org. There you'll also find some information about our upcoming programs. Now, without further ado, I'd like to go ahead and kick off today's town hall by introducing our moderator, Katie McKee, who serves as a support of aftercare and hospital development at LifeSource. Katie, thank you so much for joining us today. And at this point, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you to facilitate our discussion. Thank you so much, Deanna. And I know I can speak on behalf of all participants on today that we are quite amazed by the Alliance team and the breadth and the scope and the content and collaboration that you are uh, leading during this time. So we're very grateful. Thank you also for the lovely introduction. In a moment, I will in turn introduce our exceptional panelists today. First though, a comment on the context for this conversation. In a time when DCD donation is such a wonderful focus and there's so much innovation happening that is allowing more lives to be saved through DCD donation, we thought it would be helpful and we hope prompt great dialogue to take the focus of the conversation way back to the beginning of uh, DCD before family conversations have even occurred. Um, we have reviewed the many excellent questions in advance of today as Deanna noted and have incorporated content throughout the panel discussion that we hope addresses those questions. The one question that relates to that very beginning of the process that I wanted to comment on prior to the panel is leading and lagging indicators as they will be uh, kind of woven throughout our conversation today. Lagging indicators are those we often measure. There are measures of success. Authorization is one such measure. Weight loss, which is also kind of painfully close to home, is another lagging indicator. We call them lagging because by the time they're measured, the performance that drove that measure is already completed. It's in the past and we can no longer fix it. Leading indicators, on the other hand, are critical activities that drive the success or outcome. So these are the activities that we have influence over. And in the very basic example of weight loss, they're calorie consumption and activity. So those are, in this example, the leading indicators for a healthy weight. Life source, like so many OPOs, is really in the process of discerning which are the meaningful leading indicators for authorization, especially in DCD. And what the content of the panel today then will focus on are those key leading indicators or key elements of preparation that when present lead to the most meaningful um, in uh, conversations with families where they have the support and the information they need to make a thoughtful decision. 
So with that con context set, it is my privilege and pleasure to introduce Jody Fisher and Taylor Winkle. Jody has a Bachelor of Science degree over 10 years experience in healthcare administration. She has worked for the past eight years with LifeSource as an amazing hospital liaison where she fosters relationships and acts as a donation resource for hospitals in Eastern North Dakota and Northwestern Minnesota. Jody's favorite leading indicator are the number of days she spends at the lake. This measure is correlated with a decrease in stress leading to an overall increase in relaxation. Taylor Winkle is a family support coordinator who has been with LifeSource since March of 2019. Her impact would feel like she's been here a lot longer. She has a master's degree in social work policy and public administration. Since coming to LifeSource, Taylor has worked extensively on the DCD donation process, specifically as it relates to preparing families and surgical staff for the DCD OR. Taylor's favorite leading indicator is the number of AM cups of coffee she consumes. This measure is correlated with decreased fatigue from overnight shifts and increased ability to assist with distance learning. I will turn it over to Jody and Taylor. Good afternoon, and thank you for this opportunity to be with you here today. As Katie said, my name is Jody Fisher, and I am a hospital liaison with LifeSource. Today, I will be sharing the elements initiated by the hospital development role that lend to collaborative DCD family discussions. Well in advance of a referral, we have developed relationships with hospital personnel to really hardwire the DCD process. This goes beyond the traditional engagement of physicians and nurses and reaches to other hospital departments and personnel involved in donation, such as respiratory care, OR, spiritual care, and palliative care, just to name a few. By cultivating multiple hospital relationships, it ensures a culture of donation and lends to an overall understanding of the donation process throughout the hospital. Our day-to-day -day interactions with hospital personnel often include conversations specifically about DCD and how these opportunities can be preserved. Our educational offerings cover variances between brain death versus DCD, and most of our organ hospitals in our region have built these as separate learning modules into their learning management systems. These trainings and educational offerings also include information about trigger criteria, donor designation, the family discussion, and specific hospital policy elements. After a referral has been made, there's several touch points in place to connect with hospital care teams throughout the referral and reinforce DCD opportunities when they exist. One of these elements is the early on-site process connection. This process allows for the hospital liaison to connect with the bedside nurse, thank them for making the referral, review the opportunities that may exist, including reminding them of DCD potential, and answer any questions they may have. The early on-site process connection resource pictured outlines the donation process and highlights specific components of communication when it's critical to connect us with families to offer support, such as a family making end of life statements. We also provide standardized language addressing situations like if a family mentions donation. Hospital personnel are encouraged to acknowledge the family's comments and make arrangements to connect them with us to offer family support. This concept of early on-site process connection lends to preserving DCD opportunities, primarily because we are able to capture DCD eligible patients prior to families withdrawing care and ensure timing allows to have a meaningful donation discussion. A 41% reduction in instances of hospitals withdrawing support prior to us being notified was seen in the six months following implementation of this practice. This is just one of the ways LifeSource has measured the effectiveness of utilizing process guidance. So let's give the polling a try now and see how you all measure the effectiveness of process guidance you provide for your care teams. 
think that the first polling question has popped up. If you all want to take a moment to complete that. And I'm not sure if we'll get the results back here shortly or if not, I can move on. Oh, there we go. So it looks like this is pretty similar to a lot of the options that LifeSource uses as well. So thank you all for participating in the polling. I'll now turn it over to my colleague, Taylor Winkle, to share other process elements that further strengthen our communication during donation and prepares for having collaborative DCD family discussions. Hi everybody, my name is Taylor. Uh, thank you, Jody, Katie, and the Alliance. Um, and Jody covered our first leading indicator, which is our early on-site process connection. And I will talk about the next three. So the next indicator in the process is the getting to yes huddle. Huddles occur when a trigger has been met and a family meets criteria for a family discussion of donation. The triggers for DCD family conversations specifically include when end of life decisions have been made, when a family mentions donation, or when a family is discussing end of life decisions and the hospital care teams believe an earlier donation discussion would be beneficial. The getting to yes huddle can be explained as the OPO consult to the care team regarding their patient and the patient's family and typically includes the life source donation coordinator, family support coordinator, bedside nurse, physician, and any other members of the patient care team who wish to be included. They're a comprehensive discussion about the patient, which allows the hospital team and life source teams to establish a shared understanding and plan for communication plan of care for the patient, and a plan for approaching the family about donation. Next, you're going to see our second polling question. Uh, this question relates specifically to pre-conversation coaching calls, which is our third leading indicator that we will talk about. Please go ahead and take a few seconds to answer this poll. And I apologize, I am unable to see the polling questions. So once, Katie, you see the results, please go ahead and shift the slide. Taylor, are you able to see the results of the polling questions? I cannot see anything. <laughs> well, it looks like about 29% uh, of, of those responding indicate that they do peer-to-peer -peer coaching. 43% do manager to requester coaching. About 15%, so definitely the minority, do not do coaching. And then our favorite answer, about a fourth of respondent said it really depends if you want to speak to those. Perfect. Thank you. Um, that's, that is fascinating. Next slide, please. All right. Um, so following the huddle and just prior to a family donation conversation, the life source family support coordinator or another trained requester or staff member of life source will be approaching the family, completes a coaching call with a peer coach. So we complete peer-to-peer -peer coaching calls. These calls occur with peers who are family support coordinators and provides a very structured mechanism for preparation. The coaching calls are especially valuable for those who complete family conversations less frequently, such as our donation coordinators, hospital liaisons, or CDRs. 
Coaching calls allow the coordinator who will be working with the family the opportunity to talk through any pertinent case details with another family support coordinator who's a neutral party. They allow multiple perspectives to be discussed and time to problem solve any perceived complications or issues related to the case. Additionally, um, effective arts concepts and trainings have allowed all life source staff approaching families to have a common language, which has really streamlined and made our coaching call step quick and effective. Personally, I find great value in the peer to peer aspect of the coaching calls because I know that the people I'm connecting with for these calls are doing the same on the ground work that I do every single day. They understand the day to day struggles of the work that we all do and the wide spectrum of emotions emitted by both families and hospital staff working with donor families. Following the coaching call, all four of the getting to yes leading indicators have been met. And the final and next step is the family donation conversation. Just to review, the three leading indicators that, or the four, excuse me, indicators that we've talked about today, they're on your screen up in the right-hand corner, are the early on-site process connection, the getting to yes huddle, a pre-coaching call, and having the family conversation by a life source staff member or a trained requester. So now that we've gone over all of the leading indicators um, to help maximize our opportunity and get to that yes, how do we know what the impact is? So the graphic that you can see on your screen right now is a snapshot in time from June of 2020 through September of 2020 and includes 74 DCD family approaches. LifeSource began measuring and collecting data specific to these four identified indicators in June of 2020. We are currently working to dive even deeper into this data and to give a weight to each of the indicators to help us make correlations to their effect on authorization and DCD donation. From this current data, when all four leading indicators are present, which is evidenced by the blue bars, authorization rate increases for both donor designated and non-donor designated patients. This is clearly in illustrated when you look to the right of your screen at the non-donor designated data. Perhaps what's even more clear by this snapshot in time is the profound effect that donor designation has when families make DCD donation decisions. And that is clearly demonstrated when you look to the left side of your screen at the donor designation present data. Just to add a little bit more context to this slide, um, many OPOs calculate authorization rate uh, in different ways and use different factors to come to that conclusion. LifeSource uses a fairly conservative method for, for obtaining our authorization rate. And some of those pieces that are included in that are when a hospital or physician approaches a family and they decline donation, when a family refuses to speak with us on the phone after donation has been mentioned by a hospital, when there's an advanced directive indicating that a donor, indicating that a person does not want to be a donor, but they do have donation opportunity. And finally, approaching to wait. So when we ask a family um, to allow us time to evaluate for donation possibilities and the family declines. Now our final polling question and a hot topic of the day <laughs> relates to your OPO's approach to honoring donor designation, and DCD family conversations. Once the summary of this slide is up, I will go ahead and pass it back to Katie to close us out with a connect to purpose and then we'll move into our Q&A.
thank you for these results. And Taylor, I know in the absence of you seeing them, I will speak to them. So this question about honoring donor designation in DCD, um, first I might comment that where these amazing panel comments from Jody and Taylor don't address the first person el authorization element specifically, the leading indicators, as Taylor pointed out beautifully, really do uh, show that early in the process, if specific elements are met, regardless of whether individuals are donor designated, the timing and uh, the timing that can result and offer more thoughtful opportunities for families um, it has an impact whether the person is donor designated or not. This question was written in such a way to prompt dialogue as there were certainly lots of questions about honoring donor designation in DCD submitted in advance. And we look forward to the conversation. It looks like about half and half leaning toward the first response is that because families determine withdrawal of support DCD approaches are indeed somewhat different from brain death approaches. And because timing is an element and the way in which um, support is with, withdrawn uh, determines whether DCD donation can occur, it's ultimately the family's decision to honor that donor designation. So that's 56%. And then at the bottom, 44%, but again, uh, nearly half, uh, indicates that DCD approaches are treated the same as brain death approaches. And so that honor, that donor designation is honored in all circumstances as it is ultimately the donor's decision as reflected when they checked the box. So I hope that this will prompt uh, additional questions and good dialogue here as we move to the conversation portion of our time. We did want to, for the conversation portion of our time, just have up a connect to purpose as of course the reason we all do this work and this hard work when it comes to really discerning how we can best support families so that they can have the opportunity for thoughtful, well-informed decisions um, is the families we serve, the hope that's offered through donation and of course the life-saving effect that donation has on those waiting. Um, these are both quotes we received uh, this month. One is from the father of a young DCD donor and uh, that father talks about the care that was extended to their family um, and to his child during that process. A recipient of a DCD kidney shared the effect on her life saying, I felt like a bird with broken wings and thanks to the incredible gift of donation, I now can spread my wings and fly. So grateful for the second chance at life. So perhaps that can be the backdrop um, as a reminder as we move into some Q&A and dialogue. Thank you, Katie. Um, just as a reminder to everyone, if you do have any questions for our uh, presenters, can you please be sure to submit them um, using the Q&A feature? Um, for those of you who may not be familiar with the Zoom platform, if you just look at the bottom of your screen in that navigation bar, you should see a Q&A um, icon that will allow you to submit your questions. Thank you. While we await questions uh, to come in through that Q&A function, I will go ahead and read one that was submitted in advance from Erin McGreal Miller from Gift of Life Michigan. And that's a question that was covered in part but might warrant further discussion about how to transition the donation conversation with family from the medical team to the OPO. So I will take that, Katie. Um, basically, what we look at is we want to be providing a language that is as clear and concise as possible for our hospital team and something that can be delivered relatively easily um, and in a confident manner. So just to share like an example of language um, that I have shared with my hospital team that they can use is basically um, saying something like, I'm going to have you speak with Taylor 
she can offer you support as you start making decisions about next steps. That would just be um, some, you know, a sample of language that you could share. Thanks so much, Jody. From Jim Boggs of Effective Arts, we have the question, when and how does LifeSource present donor designation positive status to the healthcare team? Taylor, would you like to start with that one? Yeah, I can certainly take that question. Um, if known at the time of a referral, the CRS, which is a role at LifeSource, will let the healthcare team know whether or not um, a person is designated. That being said, that information is re-clarified in the getting to yes huddle that we talked about and also in the early onsite process connection if that referral was made early enough to, to have that piece included. Thank you so much, Taylor. I'm just reading through the next question from Shante Williams, Taylor. So I think Shante's question is really getting at how life sources process differs um, when we are transitioning from the hospital care to life source really assuming that conversation and care of the family. How does that differ in the presence of first person authorization versus the in DCD versus the presence of first person authorization in brain death? I can repeat um, that if needed, Taylor. Well, I just want to clarify that life source does not, in the black and white sense of the term of whether or not we off, um, on our first person, person authorization, we fall on the spectrum of it's ultimately the family's choice. So I'm not sure if that answers the question or if you do want to repeat it to make sure we've answered that fully. I'm looking to see if there's a follow-up comment, Taylor. I think, yes, I would add that it, Indeed, in that way, um, whereas we have well-defined processes for donor designation conflict, those do typically ap apply to brain death uh, when a, the person has first-person authorization and not to DCD. Correct. Michelle Reef asks, curious to know, oh, there is a follow-up. So life source does not move forward if family is not in agreement with first person authorization. I would say, um, and Taylor can echo, you know, Taylor, I'll turn it over to you to answer that question about support of the family. Yeah, well, absolutely. So we do, we will not move forward with DCD donation um, if a family is opposed to donation. Um, unlike in, of course, the brain death circumstances where we will move forward and address conflicts alongside of a family to walk that journey. We do similar things on the DCD side, but it ultimately is up to the family whether or not um, we will allow the process of donation to take place. I think the next question is related as it's a about peer-to-peer -peer coaching. And of course, peer-to-peer -peer coaching uh, involves how to best support families and really walk them through uh, the, the support and the process to give them every opportunity to honor that designation. And so this question is, curious to know, says Michelle Reef, the decision behind peer-to-peer -peer coaching prior to approaches versus manager or supervisor to request or instead. Is there data that shows kind of the difference there? And um, is, is there a professional development opportunity for experienced peer? Is that part of the approach? Taylor, you're probably best suited to speak to that as well. I am. You know, I'm not aware of the specific data we used in making that decision, although I'm sure that we did. Um, that being said, we can certainly share that after the fact. 
um, and I can speak with my manager about that. And I will say that the family support um, team manager, as well as our donation coordinator manager, are able to provide coaching, but it's always our first choice to use a peer-to-peer -peer coach. Um, and that's simply because of some of the things that I said, that it just allows what seems like a more less stressful, easier conversation to flow coworker to coworker. Um, and, you know, those people, again, are having the same conversations that I might be having every single day versus a manager who may only step in to do family conversations when absolutely needed a couple times a year. Um, so I hope that answers your question. Thank you, Taylor. Benjamin Morton asks, which departments, and give some examples, family services, HD, organ recovery, is responsible for those early huddles and hospital planning for eventual DCD family discussion? Jody, do you wanna take that one? Sure. So I think it's kind of twofold. I think um, queuing up some of the early discussions for family DCD discussions, that, that really happens between the hospital development role and the healthcare team kind of queuing that up. And then once we kind of are in a good place where we know that a conversation or a fa let's say for example, a family care conference is gonna happen, um, then it really kind of shifts to the family services side or family support role where they will come in and really facilitate the next steps in uh, walking hospital teams through that and then walking families through that uh, discussion. Thank you, Jody. Deanna, as you probably see, we have a couple of questions. I wanna do a time check. Can we uh, address a couple more or discuss a few more questions? Um, yeah, certainly. I would say if you ladies are available to kind of stick with us and address some of these questions and we can try to get through this queue if that works. Thank you so much. Thank you. Christine, yeah, Christine Chambers asks, why do you believe it is important for the hospital care team to know the patient's donor designation? I, I can take that. I think we could, Jody and I, all of us could probably speak to this, but uh, personally for me, it's my belief that knowing a patient's donor designation status really helps our hospital teams in how they speak with families and how that transitional language might occur when and if it does occur. Um, specifically, I think when we have a donor designated patient that tends to take some of the anxiety away from the healthcare team about talking to families about donation specifically. And Jody, feel free to add anything if you have anything else there. I 100% agree. I think it's important for them to know, especially to preserve um, and make sure that we're honoring the, the, pace, the patient's wishes in those situations and that we're at least going to, it ensures that we're going to facilitate the conversation to happen. And I would just add when a patient's not donor designated and perhaps the bedside nurse who I'm talking to is expressing some anxiety about us having that conversation around donation, that's an opportunity for me as the family support coordinator working with this nurse to really say, you know, it's my job to help this family make an informed decision and allow them the opportunity to say yes or say no um, when they have all the information, which just helps solidify our role in making sure that, you know, that the certified requester, you know, a life source staff member is able to have that donation conversation because we know when a, you know, a member of our donation team has a conversation, the authorization rate is, is heavily affected by that versus a hospital team member. Taylor, this uh, question is a bit related and is directed to you from Sun Reef, who's Apologies, I would ask, or forgiveness I would ask for if I'm not saying that name correctly, um, but that's a great question. Taylor, you said that you will discuss donation with the family if they have either made the decision to transition to comfort care or if the hospital care team thinks that the family may benefit from hearing that information, even if that decision hasn't 
been finalized. Can you please expand upon this? And is that something that comes up during the huddle? So that third trigger, right? So the, the two make sense when a firm end of life decision has been made or when a family mentioned donation, you know, I think for most of us, that's a green light that it's, you know, the timing's right for us to have that conversation. The third one is a little bit more of a gray area. So we know family is talking about end of life. They haven't necessarily made a firm decision or made a patient a DNR, um, but the hospital care team has been hearing those conversations and thinks the family is getting there. So in not in every circumstance when a family is getting there, quote unquote, will we approach a family before an end of life decision was made. However, um, and this really lends to our hospital services team, that collaborative preparation work so far behind where we ever even get to this point, just with our hospitals in general, you know, our hospital staff realize you know, LifeSource is going to have to get involved here at some point for a donation conversation. And this really seems like a great time for them to have that. And so that is, again, it goes back to a role that we have at LifeSource called a clinical resource supervisor, which I know is not, probably doesn't mean much to a lot of people because we all have different names for our roles. But that's somebody who's calling and checking in on referrals, um, you know, daily or every other day. And so they are getting, you know, up-to-date information on family dynamics. Um, it's, it's essentially a mini huddle um, before the actual huddle. And so just to clarify, the official leading indicator that we talked about today, the getting to yes huddle, happens after one of those three triggers have been met for DCD donation conversations. And Taylor from Daryl Jensen, he's wondering about this specific example in which the care team is on the other end of the spectrum and really indicates the family's not ready for the donation discussion. How do you get beyond that response? We, we certainly work with the healthcare team on that. If they have information that I don't have and they are you know, very certain that a family is not ready to have that conversation, um, we will support them in that and ask them to keep us updated. We'll probably check in much more frequently than we normally would um, to see where a family is at. But, you know, certainly that would be one of those gray areas if a firm end of life decision hasn't been made or if there has not been a mention of donation that we would not approach the family until one of those two pieces were met. If there comes resistance after one of those two triggers, such as firm end of life decision or a mention of donation, that's when I'll work specifically with that person who's expressing resistance, part of the healthcare team, to let them know that you know my job is just to provide this family with information so that they can make this informed decision and really to support that hospital staff member to walk alongside us um, in having that conversation should they wish because sometimes it really just comes down to their own anxieties or fears or unknowns about the donation process in general. Thank you so much, Taylor. Great overview. And Jody, Kim Payton is asking about language used in policies and training to talk about when to interact with a family for DCD. And so Kim outlines, we frequently hear, if you had asked earlier, I might have considered donation, but now it's too late. If we wait until a withdrawal decision, we are behind the curveball. So Kim's looking at the options of rewording policy and education to indicate time to work with a family. Yeah, so we, we certainly have that upfront in our educational offerings. It is included just some kind of key phrases that families might say that might lead to timing, specifically talking about timing and how families do become fatigued along, along the way and how hospital care teams really need to be looking for that in order to preserve the opportunities. So that a lot of that information is shared in the educational offerings. Um, as for specific wording or language for policies, I don't think I have any hospital policies that have specific language in there. It's just something um, that we make sure that we include in our, in our offerings. It's also on the early process connection resource. There's examples of that. And then when we touch base during that 
um, initial referral phase, we kind of walk through, here's some things to kind of look for. Um, and then, like I said, examples are given on that resource of some things that families like might say, like, for example, you know, Jody wouldn't want to live like this any longer. Um, I'm not sure how much longer we can do this. Just simple little cues and indicators that families may say that might cue in um, hospital care teams that they're, they're getting ready to have a conversation. Thanks, Jody. And a, a follow-up to that, uh, Ronald Hollabog asked, does it make a difference if a person is registered or not for when you speak to family? So is the timing in any way impacted by whether the individual is registered as a donor? It is not. Whether or not someone's donor designated, those three triggers that we talked about remain for DCD. Looks like we have two remaining questions. Jim Boggs asks if, Taylor, I imagine you could illuminate what coaching means in the peer-to-peer -peer context. What coaching means in the peer-to-peer -peer context. So I'm a family support coordinator. You guys may have different titles for the same role. So it's my job to talk with families about donation when one of these triggers have been met. Prior to having that conversation, I complete a coaching call with another family support coordinator who may also be on call that day, but is not necessarily the one who will be talking to this family that I'm about to approach. So ideally, we're having a coaching call, you know, within 60 minutes of approaching that family with another family support coordinator. Um, that just, I mean, again, it allows us to talk through, you know, through a lens of this is my coworker, you know, you're probably working on this case over here. How's that going? It just allows us to kind of go over any, maybe any anxieties or any perceived issues or even just any of our own emotional baggage that we might be bringing, you know, to work that day, whether it's, you know, my kids driving me crazy with distance learning or, my dogs won't stop barking or anything like that. And so it just allows us time to kind of settle in and get ready to have this high stakes conversation um, in the best way possible so we can support the family. Thank you, Taylor. We have um, related questions about pre-mentions from hospital staff. So Kimberly Fennigan asked, how do you handle a pre-mention from hospital staff that resulted in family already saying no? Um, how do you change your approach if that's the case? And uh, let's start with that. There's a part two to that question. You know, I can speak to it from my side, like from the real time um, connection with that nurse who perhaps said, you know, doctor such and such mentioned donation and family was opposed, you know, they said they didn't want to do donation. Um, I'll just have a conversation with that person. I'll ask about context for which donation was mentioned and how a family may have reacted to that. Um, you know, they've said they've declined, but really what was that conversation? What information was shared? And then most of the time, I will then let that healthcare team know that I still plan on having a conversation just to make sure that all of the information is on the table and allow families uh, to make that decision. That being said, if the hospital care team says, you know, it's Dr. So-and-so who had this extremely in-depth conversation with family and they made a really strong connection and family was just absolutely opposed, then we might make the decision to not reapproach that family. And it's really just dependent on each case. And um, Jody can probably speak to the work that happens after the present. Yeah, so basically a follow, we follow up with all of our, um, if there is a mention of donation with the hospital care team to identify exactly, you know, what took place with, again, to Taylor's points, the context that it was mentioned, remind them um, that we prefer that they do not mention uh, donation to families and then go through the rationale as to why we don't want them mentioning uh, donation to families. And, and basically that's not because we don't believe they can have difficult conversations, but simply because, you know, to, to keep the roles really differentiated is what leads to better outcomes. And 
nine times out of 10 uh, hospitals are always very supportive of doing that. It just comes up oftentimes with the best of intentions as offering a silver lining. Um, but we just really work afterwards to ensure that it doesn't happen going forward. There, thank you for that excellent <laughs> summary. And there is a, a follow-up question about whether there's data to suggest or data that speaks to collaborative approaches and how that impacts authorization. Um, would echo Jody's comments on that and also offer, um, we have been looking at that data, much of it which was provided by colleagues at Donor Network West as they looked at more, um, kind of the a scan of all the research that's been done around that. And we'd be happy to share that that summary. I'm gonna give a lot of credit to the colleagues at Donor Network West who have, um, who have really reviewed that research. Glenn from the Alliance asked um, if we could make that early process connection resource available and graciously offered to house it as part of the Alliance toolbox. Um, so that will be available and we will also um, make available that data summary and perhaps perhaps the toolbox could be a good housing place for that as well. So thank you for that Glenn. That sounds that sounds wonderful. That um, concludes our questions and am so grateful for the dialogue that resulted from uh, from this discussion and from the wonderful questions that you submitted. So thank you very, very much. With that, I will thank our incredible panelists, Taylor and Jody. So grateful to benefit from your day-to-day -day work and how you apply your hearts in really um, advocating for, for donation and the hope, healing, and life-saving gifts that result. I think that concludes our time and I am trying to recall if I need to turn it back over to Deanna for closing remarks. Yeah, I, I will take over from here. Thank you, Katie. Great. Thanks, Deanna. <laughs> I'll um, just simply echo your sentiments here and just extend a sincere thanks on behalf of the Alliance to um, Jody and Taylor for providing such fantastic insights into some of your family discussion practices. Um, as it relates to those DCD cases. So thank you both so much for joining us today to have that discussion. And also I'd like to recognize Katie <clears throat> for your efforts in helping us to coordinate today's presentation and for doing such a fantastic job um, leading the discussion itself. We really appreciate all that you've done to um, support us in this program. So thank you so much, Katie. And uh, to all of our participants, we thank you as always for your participation and we hope that you found today's discussion to be valuable to you and your daily practices. And we of course look forward to seeing you again on a future town hall. So thank you everyone, enjoy the rest of your day.